let's turn our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 3, verse 17. The Acts of the Believers. Acts chapter 3, verse 17. So we will read 17 to 21, and I would like us to read together. One, two, three, go. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Amen. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. And even, Lord, as we dine together, as we listen to the Spirit of God, as we hear you, O oh God, through your word, we pray that we shall receive life, each and every one of us. We shall receive liberation, even from the power of sin, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that, Lord, you shall help us, even as we dine this afternoon over your word. May the entrance of your word indeed bring light and understanding to us, O oh God, because we choose to be simple before you. Father, we praise you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. So church, this afternoon I'm delighted to share the word of God together with us. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to share about the acts of the believers uh, taken from the acts of the apostles and like we started reading, we just want to study and find out how the, 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 the apostles behaved or what they did that can impact our, our lives today and our ministries today. And thank you all the visitors who are here. Thank you for visiting us today. We have so many of you and we are so delighted to have you. We pray that you may feel in uh, yourself comfortable at the feet of Jesus because here we only preach the gospel and we love the Lord. Amen. So last Sunday we studied about uh, the acts of the believers, uh, looking back at the acts of the apostles. And we realized that uh, as believers, we need to dedicate ourselves or commit ourselves to prayer and actually to much prayer. We see the believers going to the house of God at the hour of prayer. And even as they did that, they find this blind, uh, not blind, this lame beggar who had sat at the gate called the beautiful gate for many years. The Bible tells us that he was 40 years of age. And so I can imagine how that felt for this man. He sat there for those many years and was asking for alms uh, from the people who went to the temple. I was asking myself, why is it that he didn't borrow from anyone else? But he borrowed from the people who were going to the temple every day, every 3 p.m. to look for Jesus or to worship Jesus. And this day came for the, for the beggar to be healed while Peter and John were going to the temple. And so we saw that the, the practice of prayer and every time giving ourselves and dedicating ourselves to prayer can cause a miracle to happen for someone. You know, it draws us closer to God and there's no time you draw closer to God and remain the same. Praise the name of the Lord. Prayer is the thing that unlocks every potential for every believer. Amen. Amen. 
Because without prayer, there is nothing we can do. We can accomplish nothing without committing ourselves to prayer. We saw that Jesus himself, he, is, you know, he was the perfect example of prayer. Because he even taught prayer publicly. He prayed publicly. And he even went to the closet and prayed to his father, even with prayer and fasting. And so if we are disciples of Jesus Christ, then we need to learn prayer from the person who prayed more than any other person in the world. We also see the, the apostles going to the temple to pray every now and then, and therefore we are being called back to the place of prayer. And let me tell you, church, there's a lot of evil going on in the world in which we live in today. And without prayer, there is nothing that we are going to enjoy in this world. Amen. Amen. So I am also calling upon us and even myself to the place of prayer. We also uh, learned that we need to submit more and more and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, there is nothing we can achieve. The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us. He's the one who knows the mind of God. So even as we are praying, we are in need of the Spirit who knows the mind of God to reveal that mind of God to us. And therefore, if there's anything the church needs today, is the Holy Spirit. No wonder Jesus in Luke 24, 49 said, uh, stay in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. As much as Jesus is the one who, uh, who, 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 who called the believers, he called them to, to come to him, to follow him, so that he can make them. He knew that he had made the right decision because Jesus never picked them out of the blues. He prayed and God gave those men to him. As much as he walked with them and taught them, he knew that they needed another power in the inside of them so that they can be witnesses in the world. And so he told them, wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with that power. And we see, actually, after the waiting in Jerusalem, the, the apostles of that time, the disciples of that time did wonders. You know, they did great things for the kingdom of our God. We see them walking, Peter and John, and their shadows were healing the sick. We see them touching people and people getting delivered. We see Paul, you know, shaking off a serpent because the power was accompanying him. The power of the Holy Spirit had indwelt him. And daily he was looking up to God for equipping, for empowering. And let me tell you, church, and remind us that God has not called us to a place where we, we, we are just supposed to say things, a place of information, but he has called us to a place of transformation. God has not called us to preach. He has called us to be witnesses of the things that he began to do and he is doing and teaching even today. And so that call, I'm not talking to the pastors, I'm talking to the believers. Because these signs will follow everyone that believes. And that bracket includes you and myself. Praise the name of the Lord. We also saw that you need to be, uh, you, you need to be bold enough, you know. And, and, and stand out without being intimidated by anything if God is going to use you. We also saw that you need to carry the extraordinary because the ordinary is found everywhere. But there is something that transforms people's lives and changes people's lives. And that can only come from the extraordinary. And the extraordinary is not found anywhere. It is found in the place of our closet where we walk with God and ask God, what is it that you want with my life? There are no miracles found just anywhere. Miracles are found when people are seeking God. Praise the name of the Lord. And so today, we want to look at another act of the apostles or acts of, uh, another act of believers. And when we look at the life 
of, uh, of Peter. Actually, Peter stood the portion of scripture where we read, and he said to, to the people in verse 19, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. And so the act there or the action there is that they preached repentance. They never preached these things that we are hearing today. Things of you will be rich. Things of you will be healed. Things of this and that. Those are things that accompany the preaching of the good news. And the good news that we've been called to is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and even his ascension because Jesus Christ truly was crucified on that cross of Calvary. He died and it was confirmed because when they came to break his legs, to inflict pain on Jesus so that he dies before the hour, they found that he had already died. So there's a confirmation that Jesus actually died. And there's a confirmation that he went to the tomb he was buried. They went and put him in a tomb that belonged to Joseph and covered him with grave clothes and covered the tomb with a big stone to make sure that he doesn't come out or somebody doesn't. Actually, the Bible tells us that they covered it so that the Jews do not come. The disciples should, do not come and steal his body and preach that he has resurrected. I think they were already afraid that this guy that we have put here is going to resurrect. And so they did everything possible. They even put soldiers there to guard the tomb. But I tell you, there is no soldier that could hold Jesus in the grave. There is no stone that is greater than the cornerstone. There is no power that is greater than the power of Jesus Christ. They covered him with a stone. They covered him with grave clothes. But he rose up at the appointed time of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And church, I want to declare to you that Jesus is alive. Jesus is not in the grave. Jesus is not in the tomb. And this gives us the basis for our preaching today. And so the apostles were not preaching about other things. Because, you know, the Lord was helping me to remember that the preaching that we are being called to preach is not about food and clothing. And the things that we are thinking are necessary. Those are things that accompany salvation. You know? And so God has called us to be witnesses to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that message of repentance from our sins is powerful enough to save a sinner from sin. It is powerful enough to deliver a person who is bound. It is powerful enough to liberate us from every dominion of sin. Praise the name of the Lord. And so Peter stands up and begins to tell the people uh, that this thing that you're seeking to understand, after the guy was healed and the miracle was accompanying, because when that man was healed, he hung around Peter and John. He decided, I'm going nowhere. Can you imagine you've been in a bad situation for 40 years? And then somebody comes and ministers to you and helps you to get delivered from that situation. You wouldn't want to leave that person. You want to hang around that person. So this person continued to be where Peter and John are. And People were able to see. Of course, he has sat in the beautiful gate for many years. So everybody who was coming to the temple knew him. He was new, not new. And so they are wondering, what happened to this man? He, isn't he the person who used to sit there? And the guy is saying, I am the one. I am the one. And they continue to ask him questions. And of course, this is a living testimony. The guy is standing and saying, I am the one. And it is so evident that the feet are walking. It is evident that this beggar is now praising God. That the one who used to sit outside is right inside the church. 
Church, last Sunday I told you, probably the Lord is asking you to witness to somebody out there so that they get out of that position of sitting outside and get into the church together with you. Because the minute you pause and you hear the heavens and you do what God is asking you to do, that person is going to be delivered. And we will have many beggars inside the church because they have been liberated by the power of the word of God. Praise the Lord. And so they are asking Peter and John, by what strength, by what authority is this man walking? And of course, Peter takes time to tell them that this Jesus, this Jesus that you crucified, he said to them, the Jews who are there, the authorities who are there, that you know this is Jesus, the one that has been prophesied in the Old Testament. There is a fulfillment in Christ. And you people, you Jews, you killed the author of life. And the stone that you rejected today has become the cornerstone. And you know, the more they talked about Jesus, the more they talked about the resurrection of Jesus, the more people were getting saved and delivered. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Initially, 3,000 came to the Lord. At this witness, the number is increased and comes to 5,000 people. The testimony was actually, you know, miracles happen as a sign to the non believers. And when the non believers see the sign, they believe in that God that you're preaching. And so they are seeing a living, perfect miracle that has happened. And 5,000 are here, continuing to hear. They had gathered in Solomon's portico and they are hearing what Peter is speaking to them and many are surrendering to Jesus. Many are surrendering to Jesus. And so Peter stands and tells them, even though you killed the author of life, today you can repent and turn away, turn around from your sin. And I want to tell anybody who is here and everybody who is here, it doesn't matter how big your sin is. The river that gives grace for forgiveness of sin is so wide and so flowing today like it was flowing that day. The Jews had killed the author of life, but Peter tells them that there is still an opportunity for you to repent and turn around and follow Christ. There is an opportunity for every believer today. And I want to say that even today, as we become witnesses, like I said earlier, we've been called not to preach, we've been called to be witnesses of the things that Christ has done for us. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. And you know, a witness is somebody who has been touched, somebody who has seen, somebody with a first-hand information and knowledge and experience of what they are talking about. You cannot be a witness and you just heard from so-and-so. It is not the design of, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches. It is the, the, one, of, the, the one that you have experienced yourself. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. And so we need an encounter with Christ. We need an encounter with Christ. And the gospel that brings salvation is the gospel of repentance. So they preached and these men were surrendering themselves to Christ. Paul, Peter continues to say that when you repent and turn back and have your sins blotted out, then times of refreshing shall come to you. It is not the opposite. Many people think that, let me deal with my addictions first. And then I can come to Christ. How will you deal with addiction? without Christ? How will the times of refreshing come to you unless you have repented and turned back? The Bible is not confused. The Bible is recording things the way they are supposed to be. He's saying repent and turn back so that the times of refreshing 
can come to you. Praise the name of the Lord. You have no strength, believer. You have no strength, the sinner who is here to deal with your sin. It takes the hand of God. It takes the hand of God for you to be forgiven of your sin. And so he's telling them, repent and turn back so that times of refreshing can come to you. And he tells them, you know, this Jesus that we are talking about, he is the one who was prophesied, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets. And he goes back to the Old Testament and brings to the understanding of the people what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he's supposed to do in the life of a person. Praise the name of the Lord. Church, I want to remind us that Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice for sin. Praise the Lord. It doesn't matter how big your sacrifice is, even as you come to the house of God. We can never buy salvation by our sacrifices. We only receive salvation as a gift from the Father through Jesus Christ. And so this is the message that transforms a human being. Praise the Lord. No wonder the Bible tells us that do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hallelujah. We need to get out of conformation and get to the place of transformation where the heart is touched by the grace of God, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Today the gospel has changed. I don't know whether it is gospel at all. When I was writing my thesis, I was talking about prosperity gospel and, and, and what, what it is and the impact it has had on the lives of believers. And I was told it is not even a gospel at all. There's nothing called prosperity gospel. It is something else. The gospel is one. Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Any other thing is something else. It's not a gospel at all. Praise the name of the Lord. And so I tell you, believers who are here, the only gospel that brings transformation in a human being's life is the gospel of repentance. Praise the name of the Lord. And today, the, the things that we are hearing in churches and in congregations are something else. A preacher stands and begins to prophesy. You know, you just... You, you just read the scripture and you begin to tell people you will drive the biggest car. You know, like that is a gospel. Like, is it a gospel? Like, is it helping me? Who is it helping? You know, because as I preach that you are going to receive a car, you have a bigger car. I don't even have one. You have a bigger car than myself. What is it that I'm preaching? So my gospel does not cut across. It doesn't minister to everybody. If I stand here and say that you are going to be healed, how many sick people do we have in church? That is a gospel that is not cutting across. It is ministering to a certain individual. If you're going to speak about your youth, it is a message that is just addressing the youth. The adults are left out. The children are left out. And therefore, we need a gospel that addresses the heart of man and brings that heart to repentance because the message of repentance addresses the sick and the whole. The gospel of repentance speaks to the rich and the poor alike. The gospel of repentance touches the child and the mature. The gospel of, the, of repentance talks to everybody, every rank. You may be the CEO, but you need to repent and be baptized so that the times of refreshing can come to your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be a poor person. You need to repent and turn around so that days of refreshing can come to you. I realized that when God deals with the issue of the heart, then he deals with the rest of the issues in our lives. This beggar never went back to the beautiful gate 
Or anybody found that record anywhere? I'm still a student of the word. Anyone who found the beggar back to the beautiful, be to the beautiful gate, his issues were addressed because he needed to come to the foot of the cross. And then Jesus deals with the rest of the things. Praise the name of the Lord. And therefore our gospel must be on death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And of course his ascension. Because Jesus has ascended to the Father where he is sitting on the right hand side of the Father. He is our advocate. He is, he is the one who is appearing before him. He is the one who, who is presenting my name before the Father. Hallelujah. When I commit a sin, then he is there pleading with the Father for my forgiveness. Hallelujah. The gospel of repentance touches every person. I, I watched a, a video clip of a man who had a lot of money. He said he had a lot of dollars in his account. He was among the best musicians that we have in the world. But he said he had a void in his life that the dollar could not fill. That his position and his rank in the music industry could not handle. And he didn't know how to deal with that void. And he had married and had a daughter. And because he was an immoral person, somebody who did not have character at all, the wife took off. And the daughter also went with the mother. He was left alone. He couldn't buy a wife with a dollar. He couldn't buy a daughter with a dollar. And he remained that way with a void in his heart. And one time he walked into the church. And the pastor was preaching about the love of Christ. He listened and wondered, what kind of love is that one? You mean there is a Jesus who can lo love me despite the fact that I am immoral? He will still love me even when my character is wrong? And the preacher kept on preaching that Jesus, will, Jesus loves you unconditionally. Jesus' love extends even to the sinner. Jesus' love is being released to each and every one. And he sat there and was asking himself, can I experience that love? Can that love fill the void that I feel in my life? And after the sermon, the preacher went right to the person because he was led by the Spirit and assured that person that the love of Christ is well able to take care of you. Jesus loves you unconditionally. It doesn't matter your past. It matters that he has come to your life. And the man asked the preacher, you mean Jesus can love me the way I am? And there was that assurance that Jesus actually does that. It's not that something that he will do. He has already released the grace. And that man said the sinner's prayer. When he went home, he didn't find the, the wife at all, the child at all. He has lost everything. This, the wife and the child loved him conditionally. Because it is, you must be morally upright for us to stay with you. Don't you think so? But Jesus said in your immorality, I take you to myself. I take you and I change you. I love you unconditionally. You do, not be, you do not have to be a good person for me to love you. In fact, Jesus came to die for sick people like myself. Sinners like myself. Immoral people like myself. It is his love that was extended to me. And he preached the gospel of repentance and I answered to that gospel. I want to tell you that the love of Jesus does not look for the upright. There is no upright person without the blood. Hallelujah. There is no upright, there was no good person that was too good that Jesus didn't say, I, I, I can do nothing. This man is so good, I have to bring him to myself. Nothing. He looked at you, pathetic. 
As, no, as I was. You, you are good. He looked at me as pathetic as I was. And he came and wrapped his arms around me. And he told me, daughter, you are forgiven from your sins. He gave me a name that I did not have. He called me a child of God. Praise the name of the Lord. That is the message that can transform the world in which we live in. The second thing that I see in the, in the scriptures, in the chapter number four, I know I read chapter three, but we'll continue reading from verse four, I mean chapter four, is that these people, when the authorities were there and questioning them and putting them in prison, they refused to be intimidated. And so there is a call for every child of God today. Do not allow people to silence you. When you are reaching out in faith, stand tall and preach the gospel without compromise. Situations will come to you. Do not allow them to silence you. You know, issues will come your life. Authorities will be after you. But do not be silenced by any situation. The Lord has called us to the place of authority. And it is not about us. It is about him. Amen. When Peter is speaking, he's saying, that Jesus, the author of life that you crucified and killed, in his name is this man walking. We are not preaching our names. We are not preaching our kingdoms. And we are not preaching our denominations. Yes. <laughs> By the way, denominations cannot save a man. The name of your church cannot save a human being. It is the name of Jesus. The Bible says that the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord. It is the name of Jesus that we carry. Praise the name of the Lord. And even when Peter and John said, look at us, gold and silver, we have none. They didn't say, rise up and walk. They said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They, they didn't put themselves anywhere in the place of authority or power. They used the name of Jesus. And they said, rise up in that name. Oh my God. We need to go back to the acts of the apostles. We need to get back there where our names do not appear anywhere, anywhere but the name of Jesus. It is the name of Jesus that raises the dead. Praise the name of the Lord. Do not allow anyone or anything or any situation to silence you. You're carrying power. And in that power, the lame will walk. In that name of Jesus, the sick will be healed. In the name of Jesus, the beggar is rising up. Hallelujah. The apostles went through persecution during the time of the emperors, especially the time of Nero, who crucified people and tortured the believers at the time. Some people were left in, in a hall and animals were there to tear their bodies apart. They still held on to faith. We see a man called Stephen who was stoned and even as they were stoning him, he was looking to heaven. And he's looking to Jesus and he's seeing Jesus receiving his spirit. We may not receive such persecution in our days, but we receive persecution in a way. You could be, you know, going through sickness and, 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 and suffering here and there and lack. It is persecution for the believer. But the Lord is promising to deliver us from all these things. You do not need to deny the name of Jesus because of the situation you are in. In fact, one time I realized or oh, the Lord uh, caused me to remember that my situation does not change who God is. I may be walking sick, but that doesn't mean that God is not a healer. 
I may be poor in my pocket, but doesn't mean that God is not a provider. You know, I may be suffering in one way or another, but that doesn't change the position of God. He still remains the same whether he heals me or I die. He remains the same whether I have food on my table, money in my pocket or not. It is not me who determines who God is. It is not my life that determines who God is. He is God without me. He is God when I die or I live. He is God. He remains the same. Forever exalted in heaven. And I want to speak to you, my brother, my sister, who is saying that, you know, salvation is a scam. God is not doing any business today. I want to tell you your situation does not remove God from his seat in heaven. He, he, you know, your situation does not remove him from the throne. He is God without you. He will remain God whether you die or live. Whether you eat or sleep hungry, he is God. Furthermore, he has healed many. He has resurrected many. He is God. Hallelujah. One time we went for a mission. And I faced persecution. The Lord has caused me to to be using my life as an example because sometimes there's a distance between what Abraham did and what we are doing today. Sometimes we don't identify with Abraham. It's the word of God and by the way, I honor the word of God. But sometimes we need a testimony in our days and times so that at least you can identify, you can relate. Me, I don't know what it is to go to Mount Moriah and offer my son there. But at least I have a testimony of my age and time. So we go for a mission in Mombasa, in Kuala particularly. And I had packed my bags, carrying clothes for two weeks. And because the mission was supposed to take one week, and I was supposed to go on a business uh, trip or assignment in Dar es Salaam for another week. So my bag is full of clothes for two weeks. And you know what that means. Maybe that is all I had. And so we go to Kuala, and on arrival, we are, we are ushered to a certain place. And then, of course, our luggage is left in the vehicles, and it's supposed to be taken somewhere. And so we went there and began the celebration. You know, we have arrived. We have come for a mission. We are carrying the good news of the kingdom. And... <laughs> My day of persecution had come. Somebody went and took my suitcase, the whole of it. I, I love Kitenge, I love African. So when, I am, when I'm going out for a mission, you will not miss me with a few Kitenges. But for this particular one, I had made several. Seeing myself on the crusade ground, you know, preaching in that kitenge. Seeing myself in the church, preaching in another one. And so I had done several new ones. They had not been worn from the fundi to kwale. And somebody just took the whole thing and went with it. So we finish our celebration and our dinner. And then now it's time to go and take our luggage and go to our dorms. And then I look for my suitcase, it's nowhere to be found. I was left with what I was on, just that, and my handbag. Remember, I'm supposed to be away for how many weeks? It was persecution. It was persecution. And God had prepared me for the mission field. I remember Pastor Alan had even gone ahead and brought the waters from Mwena to us and said, let us pray for this water. Let us pray for deliverance. Let us get into fasting and prayer. We had fasted. It's not that I had sinned. If I had sinned, I, I didn't know. But to the best of my knowledge, I had repented and I think I was okay to go for the mission. But I faced persecution. I stayed in that garment that day the following day, sisters started giving me t-shirts. Can you imagine you had stitched your kitenge and now you find yourself in a t-shirt? 
some skirts that were bigger than myself, but what can you do? You have nothing. So it was a day that was terrible for me. And I remember, you know, just, just talking to my husband and I could not figure out if there's any other better cloth left in Nairobi. I said, take whatever is there and sent the team that is coming on Wednesday. We had arrived on Sunday. And you can imagine Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But I want to tell us something. That whether the devil silences you or not, you must arise and preach the gospel. I had my shoes that I had bought from Nairobi. I preached in sandals. Yeah, my, my foot is uh, a few kilometers. Be and no, I couldn't fit anybody's shoe. And so the only thing that could work for me is just an open shoe. And I, I told God I will preach because I came here to preach the gospel. I preached like that. And I saw people giving their lives to Christ. It was persecution. It was suffering that was silencing me so that I don't deliver what God had given me. I want to encourage the church. Do not allow the enemy to silence you even by stealing from you, even by putting you in a bad position. Preach the gospel the way you are. The world is in need of what you're carrying more than what you're wearing. Did you hear me? The Lord is in need of the gospel. Whether you're in persecution or you're free, Hallelujah. The third thing I see is that the believers, at this particular time, they are taken to the prison and they are commanded, even after the prison, they are commanded not to preach in the name of Jesus. And when they were released, they went to, their, to the rest of the believers and they told them, this is what happened to us. We were in prison. And when they gathered together, they prayed for boldness. <laughs> Sometimes I read the Bible and I feel like I'm very far. I, I just need some stirring up of my spirit. They, they never said, God, why didn't you defend us? Why did you allow us to go to the prison and we were carrying the good news? There's no sin that we committed to deserve all this. They didn't hate God. They prayed and asked God, if you could give us boldness that we may speak in this name of Jesus. Oh my goodness. There is something for us to borrow from the believers of that age and time. If at all we are going to see the move of God in our generation. We must borrow a few things from the apostolic age. Amen. They prayed for boldness and they were not in a hurry. They took time to pray until the place where they were standing began to shake. Oh my God, we need to rise up in prayer. Rise up in prayer, serious prayer. Serious prayer that shakes the foundation of this building. In the name of Jesus. If at all we are going to see those things, it is a time to pray like never before. They prayed for boldness. Let the Lord help us as believers even to know and to sense the moments and to refuse to be intimidated by anything. We are carrying a kingdom that is greater than the kingdoms of this world. We are carrying a name that is, uh, that is greater than the names of people in this world. We are carrying a savior who is greater than the titles that we have in this world. And therefore we should not be shaken. We should not be intimidated. Praise the name of the Lord. If the world that we are living in is going to see a change, if they are going to see God, then it is a call upon us. I've been crying to God and I've been talking to a pastor that has been encouraging me a lot and telling me, Joyce, you need to get deeper. You need to get deeper. And I love those kind of pastors. I don't like somebody who tells me you're doing well all the time. I can't be doing well all the time. Challenge me to go back to the closet. And 
I, and I, I was so happy. He told me, go deeper, go deeper. If you're talking about a miracle, let it be evident in your life. And I said, yes, I need that. And it's my prayer that even as I speak about the word of God, it is evident. As I speak, I pray in my heart and in my spirit that some of the blind people that we have will begin to receive their sight. It is my prayer that even as I share the word of God, the beggar will be provided for. Their situations will be handled. Because surely God has not called us to preach. He has called us to be witnesses. Surely God has not called us to give information. He has called us to bring transformation. Surely God has not called us for lip things, lip service. He has called us to depth. He has not called us to know what Abraham did. He carried his son and went to Mount Moriah. He's asking us to act in the same act of faith and carry our sons. Sacrifice those things that we love before the Lord. One time we came to church and I, I had a few shillings in my pocket. I was just seated here. And I felt the Spirit of God asking me to take that money that I had in my bag and put it in the offering basket. And then I'm like, sometimes God is not serious. Like, this is all I have, and I live very far. I still need to go home, don't you think so? And he's asking for everything that was in my pocket. And I tell you, I sat there, I got sad. I was sad. Actually, it was not a lot of money. It was just 3,000 shillings, and he was asking for it. But it is a lot of money to somebody like me. So I'm asking, uh, surely I'm asking myself, how can God ask for a whole 3,000 shillings from me? And I sat there. People went, people came, gave their offerings. I was just there, battling with God and asking him to change his mind. And, you know, he never changed his mind. He still continued to ask for it. And so finally, I woke up from my seat and I came here. I, I can't lie to you, I was not happy. But I just obeyed, came and dropped the offering there, and I just went back and sat there. And I didn't know how to get home. But I want to tell you something. Our God is a provider. Amen. You may obey willingly. <laughs> I don't think... Abraham went to Moriah singing, hallelujah, there is the name of Jesus, and I am going to sacrifice Isaac, whom I have waited for a hundred years, praise the Lord. Did he go feeling that way? Probably he went thinking, you God, and you are the one who doesn't like human sacrifices, and you are asking for my son. I believe that there was something that was going on, but because God was greater than the son, he decided to obey him. Sometimes we do things to obey the Lord. As I gave my offering, something just happened. I was taken home. I was provided for. I never lacked. I got more than what I gave. And sometimes when you hold back to what God is asking, you don't get more. Sometimes God is asking for everything that you have and you're looking at it and you're thinking your life is paid on that 3,000. I tell you, God has millions of money, but it is until you release 3,000 that you will be able to access the millions. Our God wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. Praise the Lord. I'm not a preacher of money, but sometimes these examples make sense. In our lives... Our experiences, yes, because sometimes we may not understand how those things worked then. Praise the Lord. In conclusion, I want to say that we need to stand up for the name of Jesus. It is the living name. It is the powerful name. The Lord has called us to speak and to teach on repentance and to call people out of their sins to come to the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we do that, we shall be persecuted. But let us stand firm. Let us not fear anything or anyone. Because God is backing us up. Our message is backed up by the Spirit of God. And we preach 
in the power of the Holy Spirit. We move in the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid of, about the, uh, afraid of the authorities of this world. Jesus has conquered the world. He has conquered principalities and powers and authorities on your behalf. Your work is to march forth in faith. Praise the Lord. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Hallelujah. So as we march out, we shall encounter the rulers of darkness in this world. You will find dominions of the devil standing there and waiting to persecute you. You will find witchcraft, but I tell you, we are carrying a name that is greater than the witchcraft. We are carrying a power that is superpower, greater than the power of this world, combined. All the witches combined, they can never get to the place of the name of Jesus. They can never get to the place of, of the authority of Jesus. Many places we've gone in the mission field, we find those rulers there. The same mission we went, I remember we, we, we were divided and we were told, I, I, I remember with my team, we were told to go a certain direction. And when we went to that, to that homestead, we found many people there. We didn't know that it was a meeting of the witch doctors. They had gathered in that particular home which had been allocated to me and my team. So we went there and we found them having a meeting there and whatever it is that they were discussing. It is the name of Jesus that saves, saved us. It is the power of the name of Jesus that protected us. We went there and began to tell them about Jesus. They said, as we are from this religion and we don't believe in that name of Jesus and therefore we cannot continue to listen to you. And I don't know, by God's grace, I asked, and then can we pray and we leave you to continue with your business? They were there with their customers. And you can imagine you're bringing a kingdom that is going to destroy somebody's business. And they said, yes, you can pray. And we took advantage of the moment and we called upon the kingdom of God in that place. Today there is a church that is standing in that place that we had gone. So do not fear authorities and principalities and rulers of darkness. Your work is, is to step there to preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results with God. That is what we've been called to do. Rise up on your feet and go before the Lord. In prayer, I don't know what it is that the Lord is speaking to your heart, but we have a call to answer to. We have a kingdom that we are serving. We have a name that we subscribe to. We, we are children of God, and God is backing us up. There is authority and power in the name of Jesus, and therefore do not be moved. Do not be shaken. The Lord is with us. Praise the Lord. And church, you do not have to preach things and uh, try to entice people and try to show people things and water down the power of the gospel so that you receive an offering. These people re preached repentance and people began to sell their belongings, their properties, and brought the money to the apostles' feet. They never preached prosperity. They preached repentance and began to give testimonies of what the Lord is doing. And people began to bring. Let us not water down the gospel. Let us preach it, preach it as it is. That gospel is well able to take care of everything that we need. Hallelujah. I want us to pray. Just go before the Lord. I don't know what it is that the Lord wants with your life. I don't know what it is that you have been laying bare before the Lord, probably you need repentance. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The blood of Jesus is available for you. Probably you need boldness. 
You are this person who has forever been intimidated by what people do to you, by the situations that are going on around your life, your family, your place of work. Maybe your boss doesn't like you at all. He's harassing you, she's harassing you. But I want to tell you that that doesn't change the position of the Lord. We can come before him and tell him to use us, to have mercy on us, to give us boldness, that we continue to work as believers even in hostile places in the name of Jesus. I want to ask us to go before the Lord and pour our hearts to him. Whatever it is that has been threatening you, whether in your home or in your place of work, the power that worked in that time is still available for us today. Father, help us this morning, this afternoon. And cause us, my God, to look up to you, to fix our eyes on the cross of Calvary, to fix our eyes on the finished work of, of Christ. Help us, my Father, even to know what to tell everybody. There is a grace that flows for everybody. The power of repentance is available. The message of repentance is the one that changes our hearts and people's heart situation. Father, may you help us to stay true to your word in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we rise above intimidation. We rise above sufferings and persecution. Father, we ask that you help us to continue doing the thing that you have called us to do in the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah.